This is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It's true when I believe it. It's true when I believe it. This book is filled with hope. This book is filled with hope. And promise. And promise. For my life. For my life. Now and for eternity. Now and for eternity. I'm ready to receive. I am ready to receive. What God has for me. What God has for me. From His Word. From His Word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, and I don't know why, but I have a real hard time saying that. All too often it comes off 2 Thessalonians. And, uh, and I'm going to dust my teeth and try it again. Second, now you're not going to say it right after that, I'm sorry. 2 Thessalonians. Let me ask you, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. There are times in our life that, that uh, are standout moments. Now, from my father's generation, <coughs> there was a day that went down <coughs> in infamy, December 7th, 1941. He was a freshman in college at the time, and Pearl Harbor was bombed, and people of his generation talk about, oh, they know where they were at when that happened. Then a generation later, Late November, another president, a president was assassinated, right? And many of you can say, oh, I know where I was at when I heard about the JFK assassination. And I, I have vague memories of that because I'm not really that old. But, uh, <coughs> <all right. laughs> it's always good to have friends. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I was not sitting in the booth seat that night. <clears throat> but September 11th, 2001, most of us in this room have a very clear memory of where we were when we heard that the towers in New York came down. And, uh, and those are defining moments that stand out, that leave up a mark in our own memory. Now, I have no idea where I was the day before September 11, 2001, or the day after. Nothing really stands out there. But Tuesday morning, September 11, 2001, I remember where I was, who I was with, and who said, you got to turn on the news. you, you got to see what's going on in New York. We're under attack. It's events like that that can steal your peace. It's events like the assassination of the United States President. When, when JFK was assassinated, the country went into mourning, but also turmoil. Was this a communist plot? Was this a, of course, that question has been asked 50 years since then, too. But it shook a nation and it stole our peace in a lot of ways. September 11th, stole our peace. So lots of stuff can, can steal your peace if you let it. It rocks your world. Maybe it's a doctor's report. Maybe you just went in for routine stuff. You weren't really all that concerned. It was time for the physical or whatever. And, uh, and you get a doctor's call or a call from the office and it says, um, we'd like to schedule another appointment to do some more tests and follow some things. Kind of steals your peace to hear that kind of phone call. Maybe it's your physical health. Maybe it's your financial health. Right now the stock market is roaring, or has been for the uh, last many months. But what if it took a sudden dive? What if it suddenly uh, took a downward spiral? And whether you're depending on it right now for your, for your financing, or you're looking to your future and going, well, there goes my retirement plan. Well, would that rock your boat a little bit? Yeah, it probably would a little bit. There are things that can steal our peace. <clears throat> Maybe it's more to do with relationship. A 
family member who you, you dread family reunions because they're going to show up. I got I got to sit at the same table with. And it just robs you of peace. I'm grateful I've not had that experience. I look forward to family reunions. I look for. I, I love the fact that I can laugh at in-law jokes, mother-in-law jokes, because they're just funny. They're not, not close to the truth. They're not painfully true. They're just funny. Or maybe that's sick. I don't know. But I, I can laugh at those jokes too. Um, but there are things that come to steal our peace. And Satan works to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes that we might have life and have it more abundantly. That's what he says in John 10.10. 10. And in 2 Second Thessalonians 3.16, we read, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. The Lord of peace. In the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesied and called him the Prince of Peace. The Lord of peace. There are times when he said, and peace I give to you. Not like the world gives, but the peace I give, which is beyond understanding, passes all understanding. Jesus is our source of peace. Jesus is our peace. He is our source of peace, and there is no other source that can provide us with peace like Jesus. The world, stuff happens in the world, and it can, it can rock our boat and cause Peace to be elusive. Well, let me give you three words from this one verse that, uh, related to this one verse, that help us to focus on Jesus being our only, our absolute source of peace. The first word is intimacy. If you're using the uh, outline in the bulletin, the first one is intimacy. May the Lord of peace himself it is Jesus himself who delivers peace. It is Jesus himself who calls us by name, who knows us by name. And yes, we know that there are angels who are at work for the kingdom's sake and for our benefit. Hebrews tells us that we have guardian angels who are working to accomplish the Lord's will here on earth and in and through us. That's a wonderful, wonderful understanding, wonderful truth to have. But it's not that God has removed himself and just assigned others to get the work done. Jesus is still very much invested in our lives. May the Lord himself, there's an intimate relationship. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us by name. And in fact, the Bible says that he is interceding for us. He is speaking to Father God for us on a regular basis. And that, that reference in, the, in heaven, he is interceding for us, it is like the defense uh, lawyer going to the judge, advocating for the person who is accused. Uh, that legal scene in heaven is a powerful scene because Jesus is going to bat for us. He is rooting for us, pulling for us. And and I've been to the courtroom. I've been in the courtroom with a number of different people. And I, I'm amazed <clears throat> when I watch court proceedings. If the defendant has been issued a court-ordered lawyer, defense, if they can't afford a defense, then the court will provide one. And the, all the lawyers in the area who work through the court courthouse, I think they all have to sign on and say, and yes, I'll, I'll take my share of cases too for those who can't pay. <coughs> I think that's how it works. I'm not sure, but I think <coughs> because I've seen a variety of them, sometimes they're a paid defender and sometimes they're an unpaid defender or they're getting a stipend from the, from the state to, to represent them. <coughs> I have seen lawyers meet their client right outside the courtroom five minutes before they go into the courtroom. There's a lawyer with a stack of, of files under his arm. And he's calling up, Bill? Bill Anderson? Bill Anderson? Bill Anderson goes, 
I'm going to learn. Let's step into this room over here. Thinking, five minutes before you're going to stand before the judge? That is, I would sell something to hire a lawyer before I did that, I think. I want a lawyer who knows my name. Jesus knows my name. Jesus knows her. He is intimate with the details of my life. <coughs> and a lawyer, <coughs> that legal seat in heaven, that gives us some information about how God operates. A lawyer wants to defend you, and I know defense lawyers uh, get a bad reputation for getting people off on technicalities. And you think, wait a minute, but they're guilty. <coughs> ah, but there's a system of, you know, you got to do everything just right, and we'll see if we can get you a better deal, get you off somehow or another. Uh, and that's their job. That's their job to do that. The, uh, how, how would you like to be the lawyer who gets assigned to defend <clears throat> the guy who assassinated Lincoln? Somebody got that assignment. Because I don't think he hired his own lawyer. So, now that guy's job is to, to see whatever he can do to get the best deal for the guilty party. Now here's the deal when we go to Jesus. We are the guilty party. And it's not like he's saying, oh well, this person is not guilty. They never did it. No, we're honest. We're, we did it. We're guilty. But he says, okay, but the price is paid. Because he paid the price. Intimacy. He knows us so well. He knows exactly what we're guilty of. We're not going to surprise him in the same <coughs> room by saying, oh, and by the way, I did it. He goes, yeah, I know you did it. <laughs> I know you're guilty. He knows us that well. But, in spite of knowing us that well, <coughs> he's for us. And he doesn't just say, okay, we're going to move this over and make you not guilty. No, we're still guilty. We haven't done it. But we are no longer culpable. We are no longer responsible to pay for it because he paid the price. May the Lord himself, the Lord of peace himself, give you peace at all times. At all times. That's the second word. All times is constancy. Not okay, not just when you first come to the Lord, or just when you get to heaven, but at all times, at all times. There are various storms of life that come our way. Some of them are financial, some of them are physical, some of them are relational. Various storms of life that come our way. And at all times, He is able to provide peace. He is able to bring calm in the storm. Jesus made this promise to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, just as he would about to ascend into heaven. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the earth. That's good news. That extends to our generation. He is with us. He is for us. There is constancy here. He's not a God who checks in and takes off comes back every so often and just to see if things are still running and then leaves again. <laughs> no, there is a continuity, constancy. He is with us at all times. That's good news. May the Lord of peace himself, intimacy, give you peace at all times. That's constancy. And in every way, in every way, Different situations. Uh, and so, number three then is supremacy. Supremacy. There is not a situation that can come up where God says, oh, Sorry, I can't cover that up. You're on your own here. No, He is supreme over all the stuff that comes our way. <coughs> if you ever read the fine print of your, uh, your insurance policy, whether it's your homeowner's policy or health insurance or whatever, there are things that they, they contract, you contract with them, they will cover. But then there are 
things they won't cover. Oh, sorry, that one's not covered. What? I thought I had insurance. Oh, yeah, but it's insurance for this. Not for this. You know, anything in here, but if you're going to go over here, uh, you're not covered. Jesus says, in all circumstances, I am with you, I am for in all circumstances. He's got his cover. He is supreme. That supremacy, we can count on, we can take that to the bank. He will not disappoint us. People will disappoint us. The insurance companies will disappoint us. Jesus will not disappoint us. I was just tempted to go off on insurance, but I'm not going to go down that trail. <laughs> Oh, but the temptation is strong. <laughs> fight, and fight. Jesus is our best insurance policy. My grandfather, uh, my grandpa Rasmussen, on my mother's side, was uh, a missionary to Madagascar in the 1920s. And, uh, and as a young man, he said the argument, the debate in missions circles and in the church at large was... Can a Christian buy insurance, or is that a lack of faith? Uh, wow. Because Jesus is our insurance. He says, that was the debate when I was a young man. Can a Christian buy insurance? Now, <clears throat> I'm of the persuasion that it is good stewardship to buy insurance. It is good care for those around you to buy insurance. Uh, there's a passage in Scripture that says the man who does not care for his family is worse than an infidel. Right? So, I look at it and say, I can, in good conscience, own insurance. There may be people in the church, there may be followers of Christ who say, well, well no, I, I feel a very strong personal conviction to not own insurance through some worldly company, but Jesus is going to be in my insurance. You know, if that's their personal conviction, I'm not going to fight them on that. Um, I'm going to be grateful not to be in their family. Because uh, you know, <laughs> I, I feel it's important. And I am in, in good conscience to say, I can have insurance. I can own insurance <clears throat> without it being <clears throat> a disregard to God. But Jesus is supreme. He can give us peace in every situation. Peace that passes understanding. Peace that doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to the world. In Mark 4, 439, when, when they were on the boat and the storm came up and the disciples were scared out of their minds. And most of these guys were fishermen who were accustomed to being on the water and in a boat and, and the storm had them petrified. Must have been bad. And Jesus simply said, Peace is be still, and the wave stopped, and it became calm. And he demonstrated his power over nature, but he brought peace to a situation that the disciples couldn't imagine he could do. They had no understanding that that was within his ability to bring them peace and safety in that circumstance. And he did. He did. He did that, I think, primarily as an object lesson. He didn't do it and say, and this is what I'm going to do every time there is a physical storm and you're in a ship that's rocking. I don't think that's what he was setting up a uh, precedent for. Um, all right, we can always just say these words when it looks like your ship is going down. No, he did it, I think, as an object lesson to, know, to show us that he is Lord over all. And we can trust him in the storms of life. Romans 5.1 says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus deviates a peace so that we are no longer at war with God. Before we came to God, part of the process of each of us coming to God was the realization that we weren't right with God. And we needed to be right with God. There's a realization in a person when 
When they are on the outs with God, the Holy Spirit convicts us and comes to that little station of, I need to get right with God. I need to get right. I've met people, you've met people, you've probably had these conversations from time to time, <clears throat> of people who say, well, you know, I, I'm doing the best I can and I, I hope it all works out on Judgment Day. I hope. And, and they're not really at peace. They're wishing, they're hoping, they're, they're grasping. We can have peace. We can be assured of our salvation. Jesus says that if we will trust in Him, He will represent us to the Father. If we will call on His name, we will be saved. In uh, John's Gospel, the first chapter, it says that all who call on the name of the Lord are made able to be called the children of God. He enables us to be adopted into the family if we will surrender to Jesus. He makes peace. He makes peace so that we are no longer at war with God. Because before we're followers of Jesus, we are at war with God. We are, we may have considered ourselves non-combatants. <laughs> I'm just neutral in this war. There's a war going on in the other place. I'm just neutral. No, if we're not on God's side, we're opposed to God's side. Until we're on the inside, we're on the outside. And Jesus came to make peace and to bring us in. To bring us in. He's the only avenue. There's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, Acts 4 and 12 says. He's the only avenue to have peace with God. And then in Ephesians, and here's a passage I want to read. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 14. Uh, the setup here is, Paul is talking about the difference between the Jews and the non-Jews, the Gentiles. The Jews were the people of God who God had called to and, and had drawn to himself. And the Gentiles were on the outside. The Jews were on the inside, the Gentiles were on the outside. And Paul's writing to the people in Ephesus and says, but Jesus came to make the Jews and the Gentiles one and at peace with God. For he himself is our peace, Ephesians 2.14 says, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside his flesh, the law of setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. <clears throat> his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the Holy Spirit. By the one Holy Spirit. He brings us peace. He brings us peace with God and with God's people. We are at peace <clears throat> only because Jesus makes it so. Not because I've worked so hard at this. I am just that determined to be at peace. That I have accomplished it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get there by myself. Now I have to cooperate, I have to agree with him, but I'm not going to get there by myself. It is Jesus who is the source of peace. He is our peace. He is our peace. And when we have peace from Jesus, we are at peace with God, we are at peace with ourselves. We, we may not forget our past. We may still remember stuff that, ugh, yeah, I did that. Yeah, that was me. But he says, it's coming. It is no longer held against you. It is no longer a mark behind your name that God's going to say, oh, that's a black mark on, on you. No, we are at peace. Peace with God. Peace with ourselves. Peace with each other. So pause now and consider, where are you lacking for peace? In what situation or circumstance are you lacking 
in peace. Well, where is it that just gets your blood boiling? Gives you a headache. Gets your stomach churning. What circumstance? What relationship? What locality? When does that happen? Identify that. And now invite Jesus to be your peace there. He knows exactly what you need. He knows how to give you the words to say to that individual who seems to be the tool of Satan to rob you of your peace. Or he gives you the whatever it is you need in the circumstance that is being used by Satan to try and steal your peace. Give it to Jesus. Trust Him with that circumstance. That condition. But maybe you know that you're not at peace with God. You know, I am not right with God. Today you can make it right. Because Jesus has already provided for that. And it's pretty straightforward. It's not necessarily simple but it's straightforward. It's not simple because it requires surrender. And that is not an easy thing to do. We don't like to surrender. I don't like to give up anything. But it's straightforward. Jesus said, if you will bow to me, if you will allow me to be the Lord of your life, I will forgive your past and make you right with God. It's pretty straightforward. If you haven't taken that step yet, let me encourage you. Jesus offers peace. Today can be the day when you understand peace like you've never had it before. Peace that passes understanding, Jesus said. Let's pray. Father, in this place, we believe what you said. We believe that you said that we can have peace through Jesus Christ. We believe that you want us to live in peace. To not have the turmoil, the anxiety, the, the fear that Satan is constantly throwing our way. Thank you, Jesus, for knowing us personally, for that intimacy. Thank you for being constantly with us. Constancy in our life. And thank you for being supreme. There is nothing which is too big for you. And now, Lord, for those in this room, I pray, who are not yet at peace with you, that this would be the day of salvation for them. And if that's you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, then simply pray something like this. Father God, I know I've done wrong messed up. I've hurt others and hurt myself. And God, I need you. And I want you. Forgive me and change me, I pray. Thank you, Lord, for making the offer of peace to me. And more than that, the offer of adoption, that I can be a child of God. And part of that means that you give me eternal life. There's a great future on this side and the next. And Lord, I'm ready to receive all that you have. I surrender. I allow you to take control of my life, to instruct me, to direct me, to correct me, and I will follow you. With his head bowed and eyes closed, while we're still in an attitude of prayer. If that's a decision you just made, that's the first, that's the first time decision for you. You have become a child of God. A couple of things have happened. If you just did that, you, you are being celebrated in heaven right now. The Bible says that when a sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. And I want to celebrate with you too. So if you if you just did that, would you raise your hand up my way? If you just ask Jesus to forgive you, to be the Lord of your life, 
Would you raise your hand real quick, Wayne? I have a gift I want to give you, a Bible study to help you get started in your new walk with the Lord. If that's you, let me know. There's an upraised hand. Would you? Amen. For most of us in this room, we've already made that decision. But there are times when the door cracks open a little bit and Satan sticks his foot in and tries to steal our peace. And we've thought about those circumstances, those conditions where we feel peace being ebbed away, chipped away. And we've named them before the Lord. I'm going to encourage you to do another thing. Write that down. Make a note of it someplace so that when it happens again this week, you are reminded Jesus is supreme. Jesus is always with us. He is more than able to accomplish what we need. And he knows us by name. He knows it already. We've given it to him. We're trusting him with it. So if you've already named it to the Lord, write it down and put it in a place where you can be reminded so that when Satan tries that trick again, you are ready with an answer. You've already given it to Jesus. Jesus is in control. Thank you, Lord, for being in control. We give you control. We take it from Satan's hands and put it into your hands. We know it doesn't belong in our hands because we're not good with it. We give it to you and we trust you. Amen. Make a note for yourself so that you can be reminded Jesus has your best interest in mind. Let's stand together. Romans 15, 13. When I pause you feeling the missing word. May the God of fill you with all joy and peace. There it is. He wants to fill you with peace. As you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless. Have a great day.